Yeah, I, let me answer it here in just a, just a moment. I don't want to answer it until I see it in front of me. It replaces, it, re, it actually just replaces that first um, couple of sentences, that first little paragraph on page 8.9. So the figures, the figures should remain. So we should say not adding, but replacing. I do stormwater. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, 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 I haven't researched what this is, so I can't comment on it. Okay. So, 
what I'll do is give this to Dean and have him write up another different amendment for pulling that out. Okay. Put it down the back. So next, we heard from Amy. Haven't heard from her. Okay. Called her text her, no answer. It's not always good coming in. Good yeah. as well, whether I'm here yet. Okay, so, so you're clear you don't, you don't need anything else from me. Okay, thank you. Oh, well, question. Um, we have a little bit of time. Is there any way we could craft up an amendment that we could then, when we're done with this one, <coughs> kind of finalize and give a recommendation to the body for two things? Or does that really matter? Uh, we could, if you want, option two, draft your name. You have the draft amendment. The uh, electronically. I do, and I had sent. Christy doesn't do it like we do. Oh, like I just all I have is the language. Story. So if you want me to do something else, I. I was wondering if you could copy and paste it to you. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Okay. okay. I mean, it's pretty clear. Yep. It is. This is what I did. I just was looking for the you want to do a recommendation on this? We would recommend that. I would do it. Okay, so you want to go back or you want to go to Hollywood? I should do Hollywood. Okay. Um, what about it? Are we going to discuss babies to the wastewater? We'll go back to that. That was the yeah. We kind of wanted to wait until we got here before we discussed your amendment. So I tried to call her, but there's no answer. I tried to text her.
So it's 503, or sorry, 504 without the fence that Helen has already, already installed. Then 567 with the fence to the corner of the child daycare, and then 784 from the front door of the retail facility to the front door of the daycare. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? It was actually right. So I don't know that in our last meeting there was any question on the measurement. Well, I think no, that I think that there was some concerns from from Amy and, and Mr. Kenny about whether or not this, the fence was put up to kind of get around the distance, and it certainly makes the distance greater. Um, but it, it, even without it, it was it worked. And so what we want to do is come in and come up with some proposals about shielding the daycare and for children to not see the marijuana facility from the back of their daycare. So the, the 784.7, that's from the front door to front door? Front, front door to front door, yeah. <coughs> but there, I mean, what, what's confusing is there's also 567 over on that same line, but that's just from the front door of the retail store to the corner of the lot of the daycare. Okay. You said originally there were no residences around the area. I didn't see any. Did you? On 86, there is an apartment building on 86 near the back of the child care facility. The 86 then Dakota. There is a multiplex housing there. There she was when I drove by there last week. Is, yeah. that, is that why there's a ton of cars back there? Yes. Is that a, is it a dealership? Lot 18. Yeah. What? Lot 18. Yeah. Lot 18. Lot 20. Lot 3. Lot 3. Lot 2. Lot 2. Lot 2. Lot like, like Lot 20, there's a residence there. Looks like it's an apartment building. I, I, think the, I think at the mechanic shop. Yeah, yeah the one right behind the red. There's quite a bit of mixed use in this area where, you know, people have got shops and they live above them. Yeah, it's, it's I-1. Um, I mean, the Sunrise Drive is the only one It's mixed use, so we're getting we're industrial, uh, uh, commercial, and residential, and for some reason they put a child care facility there too. So, yeah. Something for everyone. Something for everyone. So, the concern that Amy had brought up, and I guess I'll speak to it, is that um, there's some language in the applications, the state and local, that, that uh, speaks to the idea of the property will be legally conforming. And there were questions about whether this was legally conforming because of that four foot buffer and the idea of after they made their application, they put in a fence and it made it look like there was an effort to twist the property into conformity, right? Not a functional fence, but like a, if you look at the picture, the fence is like this, it's image A, the small little kind of technical solution, right? And uh, there was a previous solution that was in the right of way. They've been working hard to make this work. And uh, I've been following this close because of Amy's concern. Yeah. And uh, so to the applicants that may come in the future, it's important that you investigate your properties and no 
know these things beforehand, and if you are going to make changes, I would recommend you make them before you submit your application. Mm -hmm. Then it doesn't raise the attention of all of us to the fact that, well, maybe it wasn't an application and now it is at licensing, or it raises the question of, is there a game being played here? Because there were concerns expressed by the public about that site. And so that's well, what the concern was like and why it's back what in front of us. So when I was done one night in virtual. Mm -hmm. She's right, so that's why we uh, wanted to provide the, the additional information and highlight that, you know, before the fence got in, it was 504, and I always make fun of Helen because she, that fence, you know, it's like three feet high, and she, to her, that's really, that's really high. Well, there was a previous <laughs> fence. There was a previous fence, it wasn't very good, and, and so, also, this fence is not up yet, obviously. Um, <coughs> we're feeling, and it won't be able to go up until the springtime, because you have to put the post in, but they're not going to be open. Before then, anyway, we haven't pulled the permits and haven't started the construction. So, does staff write out a special limitation for this? Or how, how do we how do we make sure that well, that up there? I guess if we don't do it, you can at renewal say you didn't do what you promised us we're going to do. Or maybe you have to make that a condition. It's not a rezoning, it's a uh, special land use permit, like conditional use or something. So uh, a condition of approval to provide a fence as depicted by, you know, this exhibit or to provide a bouquet fence or a screening fence or, or uh, resolve with planning the uh, provide showing a, a fence on the site plan. Um, uh, we could uh, craft a, a sharing to craft a language with the applicant that, that could be added as a condition of approval that would, would uh, require them to provide whatever it is that you're seeking in terms of fence if, if that's the way that the assembly wanted to go. I would caution that you don't add the language of putting on a fence on the other property into the condition right. only because you can't actually require yeah, them to do that and that would then make a barrier video to throw up. But we will ask. Yeah, of course. Yeah, we'll make it all. Okay, so is that something you can do then? Yeah, I could add a that um, that make it a condition, put it on the resolution, and set that well, it would have to be an S version. <coughs> yeah, I mean, I think I think uh, the way that we've handled these before, you can do it right on the floor and as the assembly, and then Mandy can add it on, you know, modify it that night at the meeting to add that condition, and that might be the simplest way to handle this. We we've been doing this pretty well all along. If somebody you know, say, so, well, we can't do the striping until next spring, or we can't do the landscaping until next spring. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it's we're requiring it, and they know they're going to do it. It's just yeah, it's winter just, time, and you just can't do some things in the winter time. So, so you, you would just say, you know, add the fences illustrated on the exhibit A um, okay, by, so by this stump by, you know, next summer. And this coming amendment. summer. So we just, when this, this is on yeah. our agenda, so we just have right. an amendment. Right, when the case comes up, you'll discuss the case, and then you'll add that as an, uh, an additional condition. And you'll write that up? I can give you the language. I can pass along the language if you want. If you would, please. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, I was just going to comment on this. I think uh, process-wise or functionally, the way that we handled these before is an assembly member um, introduces an amendment um, uh, or introduces a condition of approval in writing and Distributes, distributes it laid on the table or something like that. But yes, the planning department can write that condition of approval up. Um, would you like us to write it up in the um, uh, amendment form or just simply send you the condition of approval to have your attorneys or whatever uh, throw it into uh, uh, that one pager amendment? Francis, what I'm thinking of too is just I'll go back this morning um, and write it up and I'll send it to Mandy and Mandy can forward it to the assembly members and well, but, but, but Sharon, <laughs> Sharon, Mandy, they, they may want it in the, the format that we have. I have that template. Um, yeah, but make it look normal to us. And then, I, I mean, is, does this work for everybody? Or we come works for me. Okay, so you could put on there by every yes. assembly member here. Yes. Um, so that sounds pretty simple. I think the chair said no way on the table. I I did through the end of the year, so yeah. no, so just through this meeting, meeting because we've got a budget to deal with. Well, yeah. I think he's really referring to. 
this is laid on the table. And then so we're going to get some of the resolutions coming forward when we got the budget in the last one I talked about. Okay, okay. So, uh, so, so then are we going to keep our November? I think this got continued to the November 21st. So are we going to keep it that date? So are we comfortable with the overall applications of this amendment? Well, you got a motion on that? I would move to accept this change. Yeah. 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 And then, <laughs> and then I did just so we you don't know, want you to do this. I did email this to Amy a couple, a couple times, and I know that everybody's super busy, so I'm hoping that um, if she doesn't get my emails, maybe somebody could update her. I, I did email. Okay, okay so we have uh, approved, uh, recommended that change be recommended approval. Do this one. Um, so uh, just to make sure this after the meeting so that we don't get it confused, the planning department is going to prepare uh, a new condition of approval on the template that the assembly uses for amendments on the floor and is going to prepare that um, and uh, coordinate with the applicant on the language that's acceptable by the both parties. Um, we're going to send that to Mandy who is our sort of point person on um, on uh, distributing things to the assembly. Um, on that uh, template, um, all the members around the, the table here uh, will be on as, 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 as introducing that amendment. Is, should I strike anyone's name? Mr. Trainee, anybody? You don't have to. My name can be on, fine. The only name I would strike is Forrest, because he's not part of the <laughs> I'm not here. Forrest and Steeler. Okay, Forrest and Steeler are off. Well, um, the short is I want. Discussing this to save us final yeah, year. I appreciate that. And, um, and uh, now the condition of approval. What are the things that you guys want in it? Was, it, was that all in? Uh, uh, was there a consensus? About it? It's the fence that's in the way. Okay. 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 If, if we because we'll come up with that, we'll craft language that, that calls that out. That's the fence you guys want, and um, you know, it's that one. Is that intended to be a? Uh, um, uh, a privacy opaque uh, screen yeah, fence, or is fence. that okay? And that it's, um, you can't see through it. Oh no, yeah, that, that's because that's an expensive fence, and and um, it's not a, a chain link fence. This is a going to be a privacy fence. But it could be a chain link. You put a box. Yeah, screen. Well, so this is what, okay. This is why we talk about these things. So if you take a chain link fence and you either cover it with a fabric, um, you know, a fabric structure, or sorry, a. a, a fabric that you see in some industrial areas, I forget what that's called, but the, 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 the tent fabric uh, sort of uh, um, uh, attached to a, uh, a chain link fence. <coughs> or if you do um, those sort of green or red little slots, slats, slats into it, now that um, is not an opaque fence. You can see through that, it's semi-transparent or whatever, um, and they look ugly. And so you, you guys need to figure out, do you, do you want a chain link fence with uh, some sort of uh, uh, some sort of uh, a fabric or a slats in it, or do you want, um, you know, a wood fence? What, we, you guys have to figure that out because we, if we're going to write it up, um, and I'll tell you that, you know, even though this is industrial zoning, those fences are not pretty. You know. But but a fence is very expensive to the property owner too. So. Um, so I think the slat um, fence is a little more better than the, you know, slat. So if you do a chain link fence with the slats, it's not, it's going to be see-through. Um, but maybe that's fine. Um, uh, and the, the other thing is, is if, you, if you picture an, an eight foot tall, you know, chain link fence along that street with these slats, I mean, is that what you guys are intending? Eight foot? No, it's not going to be. It's not going to be. Okay, so what's the height? Well, we were thinking six foot. Um, okay. Yeah. But eight foot. Six foot, not eight foot. Eight feet yeah. kind of tall, and I was talking to him that tall. I don't think so you can do eight feet. No, six, six foot. Six foot is sufficient. Okay, six foot with with the slats. Is that what slats. we're talking about? I'm comfortable with that. Okay. I don't think we have to be so prescriptive on the kind of fence. Oh no, we absolutely do. What if they, they like get the wrong kind of slats that we deny there? I, I don't know. Like, no, no, it's it, it's very simple. We just need the parameters for this because if you guys approve a fence and then they come back and show us something different than it's built, then it, you guys say, well, you know, we didn't do our jobs or something. Well, hang on, let's take a look at the definition. 
definition uh, here. Uh, here we go. We have open <laughs> ornamental, and it's, it gets pretty technical. Well, what's the all, rule? All I need to know is do you want it to be slats and how tall do you want it to be? Because they're showing four foot and then I guess six foot. Do you want it to be six foot around the whole way or a six foot terrace down to four foot? Well, we have to terrace it down to four foot for the purposes of the stop sign. Okay. That's the reason why we ta like tapered it down at the corner there because we didn't want to block people. Right. Okay. So I'm hearing six foot with slats. Right. What we're talking here is slats. Yeah, I agree. Well, no. Um, well, yeah. So I have a question on that. Um, as you're talking about working with the school, and that's a much smaller project, it seems like an actual opaque fence there makes sense. And then on uh, this larger school or daycare, this larger project then is reasonable then to do obscuring, which is the kind of slats. Right, so and the other one does protect perfectly from the visual. It's a little yes. more expensive on a smaller project. Seems reasonable. Is a slat fence a fence side obscuring? Seems like a, a slat fence would qualify as a side obscuring definition. if it's a one foot by one foot and only twenty five percent visual to the other side. Yeah. So that should achieve what what the site obscuring is defined as. By just use by utilizing a slat a slatted fence. Yeah, right. I would what agree. What that are you trying to hide? Side yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. What's yeah. the purpose of the fence? What are you trying to hide from? You trying to hide the daycare from the from the marijuana shop, or are you trying to hide uh, the shop from the daycare? Uh, the passers shop. by. The shop and the daycare, and then Mr. Trini had concerns about kids walking down Arlington Street. Where they can see. Um, All the operations are inside, right? That's correct. Oh, that. We're just trying to address the concern. I know this is Mr. Chaney District, so we're just trying to trying to address. Except we're on a Burberry where there's smoking pot outside the building, and that's going to be here today or that one. You can't Sorry. consume within 20 feet of the premises. Yeah, they are. They're all that are at the very end of the Who was? In front of our Burberry. That's oh, right. That's an actual Yeah, wait a minute. Hold on. Let's focus here. We got the subject. Let's move the road to the subject. We're going to talk about so where we, we have um, six foot tall, side obscuring fence, however. Or I, what I would think it is, it's a six foot fence, chain link with slats. Can we just say side obscuring? Yeah, if, yeah. But with the understanding, I think it might be helpful to say with slats if that's what their intent is and then we then there's no confusion about what type of fence they, they will construct. For what? You might upgrade though. Yeah, exactly. What if they want to make a nicer fence later at some point? You know, like they went back to us to get a change. No, as long as it's still sight obscuring. Right. No, no, uh, Forrest is right. We have a minimum of sight obscuring fence because they could always uh, right. do a great. Why don't we phrase it that way instead of saying here's the exact kind of fence you can do? Why don't we use the legal term and say minimum six foot fence sight obscuring? Yep. Except at the corner. Except where you have to want to. Because the property owner might not want to be, you know, limited to, to a slatted fence where they can put up a cedar fence. Yeah. Maybe later on they want to put some fence. Okay. Yeah, she wants slatted. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. Thanks for the question. Okay. Helpful. Thank you for the clarification. Okay. Save that music for another one. Too. Yeah, we have to save it. Okay. So we have uh, basically said we'll recommend approval of this given that. So you just said something I want to clarify. You just said we'll make this a template. And I think that certain neighborhoods would probably require different fencing because of the design style and sensibilities and the neighborhood plans where these things might happen. So any thoughts toward this being a template is I'm thinking this being a template, the definitions of what the different right. sites are. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. Not that this creates a standard right. that for marijuana businesses they have to have slatted to chain link fences of six foot tall. I don't want to But this just gives us a reference to go to. Because my neighbors would feel that that's on couple streets. Well, not only that, but we don't want to turn this into a a requirement for everyone. It shouldn't be a yeah. requirement for everyone. Well they met the rules. This was this yeah. comfort from maybe and uh, yeah. You know, if you're standing at that back corner of that day court here, it does seem like it's right there. You know, it's 500 feet, it feels like it's right there. So there was some sense that a little more was done. I, and this looks very good to me. You know, upgrade the neighborhood quite a lot. So I think your number one concern is going to be smell. You know, because those parents, those yeah, students, their concern is going to be what they can actually tell. And so, excuse me. 
Stay right here. picture so that you can see this. The house puts pressure on the dirt around it. Yeah, is there a, yeah, there's probably no footing. So basically, a standard footing is going to be 42 inches deep to the bottom of the footing on a typical house, 90 plus percent of that way. The septic tank is only two feet away from the house, and then it's going to be buried at least three feet deep. The top of the septic tank is going to be roughly around the same elevation as the bottom of the footing. So you're going to have this five foot diameter void, basically too close to the uh, to the foundation. There, there's kind of like a prism of influence. There you go. I relinquish the yeah. control to you. Yeah, it's both here. So this, is typically 16 inches wide, all right? The septic tank is more like 60 inches in diameter. And so to bury the septic tank deep enough that you get enough insulation on it so you don't have freeze issues, the top of the tank is going to be pretty close to right where the bottom of the footing is. There's Soils engineering is really complex, but to simplify it, we just kind of make this big assumption that there's this prism of influence coming off at about a 45 degree angle right off the bottom of the footing. 
this tank is going to be inside that. And the tank's not designed, this tank's designed just to take soil pressure and to take hydraulic pressure from groundwater. It's not designed to, and, and in an earthquake, when things start shaking and whatnot, and the soil loosens up, it can start loading the septic tank, which was never designed to take it. We don't want the septic tank that close to the house. So, so let me ask you a question. What are state standards? Oh, uh, I don't know what the state standard is. Because they referenced it in their, in their, in their, um, state, the state is five feet, and you guys are recommending to go to 10 feet. So, no, um, right? so what our, what that first paragraph says is what Ross has explained there, and that, that could end up being five feet. Like, if you take it outside that 45 degree angle, it could be five feet away. But we added the 10 just in case yeah. somebody didn't want to do that assessment and, provide a draw you know a drawing to us to show that they were meeting that 45 if they just want to put it 10 feet away and not worry about the 45 degree angle then they can just put it 10 feet away but if mm -hmm. they show us that 45 degree angle but, then, it, then it could work to be closer yeah they could put it closer we're just saying we want the tank outside this prism of influence so this uh, exception is in the current document well, what they, what they were saying is they wanted to take it from 10 feet, it essentially go to two feet versus the, the exception is five feet, and that's what they were talking about. Removing, because they thought if you went to two feet, you wouldn't need the exception. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, exactly. So I guess the discussion comes back to, um, you know, to me, this is probably uh, one of the amendments I, would, you know, I proposed because the Chugaki River Advisory Board issued, I, I attached it as an AM, their, their letter, and they asked for three amendments, and this was one of their three. Um, I'm not too married to it, but at the same time, I understood it, and that's why in draft, the Dean and I went back and forth, and we didn't want to make it confusing, so we said if the assembly chooses to go with two feet, you clearly don't need the exception. Does that make sense? That's why it's drafted that way. Um, I, I completely understand what you're saying. And, and through the, if you do go with two feet, the whole first part of that paragraph should just go away because it, it's meaningless at this point. If you say that a septic tank can just go two feet from a foundation, then they don't need to consider this prism of influence. Um, you know, after going back and talking with some of the board members and whatnot, I personally uh, would be fine with withdrawing this amendment. Okay, so we're leaving it at 10 then? Well, as I, yeah, five. because the way she, she explained it to me is as long as they can make it to five if it meets those parameters, I'm, I'm fine with that. Mm -hmm. right, and so what I understand is then if it's within that prism, then they have to come in for review. If it's outside of the 10 feet, then they're just on around it. It's all fine. Yeah. So where, where, is where is that written? Huh? Where is that written? It's oh, it's a part of the permit. Um, when they submit their plan, either it, we're going to measure it and it's 10 feet away, or if it's less, then um, they might have to do a little section drawing to demonstrate. So it'd be in your... It'd be part of the permitting. We, we could even do it. Was, all we need to know is how deep is the footing and how deep is the tank. Yeah. And then we could just draw it up. Oh, okay, is it in or out? Yeah. You know. We'll probably put together some little chart. Does sheet soil sheet type sheet. or slope have an influence as well? In reality, it does, but we're making it simple by by doing this procedure to, to not have to get into all that. Does that work for the septic engineers? Yeah, I can hear what, what Ross was saying. There is there's a problem if you're going to crunch it two feet, unless you did some elaborate engineering evaluation that said that because of the soil structure or it was on bedrock, for example, that would be the exception. But then, in those situations. There's always an exception or a waiver process in the code. If we were on a pure bedrock and wanted to put the tank two feet away from it, I'm sure we could go to that department and show, hey, there's we're not putting any soil pressure on the tank, we're sitting on solid bedrock, and they would issue the waiver assuming they had adequate engineering justification for it. But even this one home the Even if it was <coughs> home, yeah. yeah. If you're sitting on pure bedrock. But again, everything is waivable under the right circumstances. 
but as a as a, I think what they're trying to do is develop a fairly simplified approach is you do this analysis as it was sort of laid out there. And if you don't want to do it, you just move it out to 10 feet and then we're not going to, if no questions asked, because the, the current code that we've been using for decades is five foot separation. And we haven't had any issues with that, but it's not to say we wouldn't. The state code is actually 10 feet. And so um, what we're doing now is more consistent with what the state requirement is. Does it, does it depend upon the material of the tank as well, whether it's fiberglass, whether it's concrete, whether it's Absolutely. reinforced or not? Or One of the, yes, the problem you run into with steel is you can't really do a structural analysis on steel because the properties are changing over time. And I think they were going to address that later here, but that, that's one of the issues is if you put in a fiberglass or a concrete tank that was structurally designed for it, yeah, you could probably submit all that paperwork to them and get some justification for putting it right up or underneath the foundation or part of the foundation. But in reality, most people aren't going to go to the extent for the engineering to do that. Okay, so we will uh, skip Amendment 1. Yeah, I'm basically a mass analysis. You look at, they got a property line that you want to know what, how much nitrates are leaving the property and how what's it going to impact downstream. So you do an entire, you look at what's happening with the background, what you're putting into it based on the size of the septic system, the, the quality of the, the effluent that's coming out of the septic tank, plus what the background water is looking like. And you add all that together and you come up with some number at the property line. Right. With the objective being if we're going to build 40 new homes uphill from you and you had nitrate levels of 8 milligrams per liter on the downhill side and then we determine that you've got this mass of water coming down that's diluted to whatever level with nitrates from all the septics. By the time it gets to all these wells or all of a sudden all these wells are going to be 12 milligrams per liter and above the allowable level. So that's the objective in the analysis is to determine when it's all said and done, are we going to adversely impact what's downstream? And those, the impact analysis does take into account, like you said, the number of uh, lots and assumed number of bedrooms and how much wastewater is actually going to be put in there. How long the upper fertilizer. I mean, the nitrate the fertilizer, that would be coming downhill as well. Yeah, yeah. In the agricultural areas, that would be a really big issue, yeah. but you're right. It, 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 the, our problem is, is we'd be trying to evaluate, evaluate what impact that would have, but you're right. It's, it's a legitimate That's a case by case study. Yeah, case case case. Look at. Yeah. And you, in not just fertilizer, but also, I, I know it raises all kinds of, of hassles, but there are people on the hillside that have um, horses, yeah. and they have ducks, they have, you know, other um, barn animals that, farm animals that, 
when their waste breaks down, it adds to the nitrates. And so all that has to be taken into consideration. The five has been traditionally a, a threshold level to where it's beginning to creep up and we need to look at it to make sure that we, it doesn't creep up or if it does, it's not going to adversely impact downstream. And currently the 10 is, you said EPA guidelines. So, um, and this is the, the point of this particular one. We have a lot of, um, well, we have llamas. One of my neighbors has llamas. I mean, we, you know, I, there's a horse, there's a horse farm near me. Um, I guess it's technically not a farm, but yeah. Um, so again, the Chugaki River area, um, typically as the advisory board said in their opinion or in their letter to us, they said in our area, uh, we already have a lot of properties that have these elevated nitrate levels and turning it around and going beyond the federal EPA guidelines is going to adversely impact our area because we're already kind of looking at this and watching this, but what they're saying is we're really becoming um, overburdensome by basically cutting in half what the federal regulations are. That was my question. What is your rationale that for shifting from the federal requirement? Or well, the, the federal requirement is for, for public water. It doesn't apply to the private, but, but we do look at that. Um, if public water is above 10, they gotta do additional treatment to get it below that. Mm -hmm. So you can't do that to an aquifer. You can't go, oh man, it's above 10. How do we fix the aquifer? Uh, we can't. What we wanna do is prevent it from getting to I think a key point, this is for new subdivision development we're talking about here. We're, we're not talking about regulating existing <coughs> homes and wells. So you just need a proper new so construction going reason. forward. Being, yeah. being yeah. lower to start and a benchmark. And you're not saying <coughs> no subdivision if you get five. You're just saying you need to look at that. Well, they, I mean, they might have to be required to have nitrate reducing systems. I mean, that would be the the worst case yeah. is that on the flat we would require them to have a nitrate reducing system on all those new lots. Um, just oh, to address a cool. comment you, you made, Chris, is the um, we're not changing the the federal limit. All we're doing is we don't want the water. To, and, I, and I actually agree with. I know this is a probably a red letter day that I agree with the municipality, <laughs> but we don't want the the aquifer to get to that limit. So what we're trying to do is is to prevent any future development to raise, get it closer to, because there are there are areas within Chugach Eagle River up on the hillside that do have, and even in Muldoon, that do have high nitrates that we we don't want to, 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 to we don't want it to raise above the, the EPA le levels. Yeah. Um, what I was gonna point out too is under state regulations, if we were designing a wastewater treatment system that produced brood and discharged over 2,500 gallons per day, which would be very similar to a lot of subdivisions. I mean, it would take about you know five lots or four lots theoretically to create 2,500 gallons a day. By state regulation, we have to do a nitrate impact analysis to prove that the nitrate levels will not exceed five milligrams per liter at the property line. So that's built right into state code. So what the proposed, what the, the way the regulations are set up here is pretty consistent. It's saying. It, 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 they're using five milligrams per liter as a canary in the coal mine and trying to head it off before so we you know we're not at 10 next thing you know now we put in 40 new homes and now we're at 14. Now we're going to create all the water. Yes yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So I need. I'm synopsis. Okay. Um, so we're I cannot, and all our planning people left. <laughs> we really need it. <laughs> as far as I know, the, the short plan has a 
a minimum of number of lots involved and it has um, particulars like I don't think you can um, vacate uh, right away easement, you know, things like that where it is simpler and that's why they charge less for their units in the middle of that. I don't know the exacts because I, I look at it the same, you know, uh, the same either way when I review it for the septic system. Well, I guess from the staff standpoint, we were looking at what the actual amendment was and they were, they're proposing to not require the items under 410 um, as part of the short plat. And I mean, looking at the requirements, we would still want to to look at all of those on a short plat. I mean, making sure that they're not dividing the lot into you know smaller than 40,000. Um, identifying that there's space for septic and well. I mean, we don't want somebody to chop up their lot and then sell it off and the guy that buys it thinking he has this great developable lot, like then comes to us and we're like, sorry, you can't, you can't develop that. Um, so we, it is, I think it doesn't matter whether it's short or long, we would want to look at the items under 410. Um, when I went to that meeting, I thought they were, I honestly thought that amendment two and three were kind of combined. I thought they were concerned about having a, night, a big nitrate study on a short plan. Like that's what I got out of the meeting. Um, and I, I, you don't normally, I mean, you wouldn't normally ask for a nitrate study if somebody's taking one lot and dividing it into two. Um, that's, it's not really, I guess, yeah, I guess maybe it depends. So. Well, it's, it's kind of a, a newer code to be codified. Um, so, uh, you know, a nitrate, uh, what's the exact term we use? Uh, impact analysis, uh, when you're looking at just one lot to two, the, the impact is an, an additional, not a whole lot, because we're only looking at a three bedroom house to have 400 gallons per day per bedroom, total effluent uh, discharge. So, um, yeah, but it's possible if you have higher nitrates in the area, uh, you know, adding that much more, it's not that much, but it's, is it going to impact it? Is it going to raise the numbers for you know, the, the neighbors? And yeah, we probably should be looking at that. But it, it would not be as involved as a 40 lot uh, subdivision. So maybe I missed the mark on this one. And maybe I misinterpreted what they what they were telling me. Um, can you expand a little bit on what you were saying, what you thought their intent was? Because Again, I, I got the whole, okay, yeah, the cost, and maybe that's what they were talking about, is not requiring extensive nitrate survey type things. Yeah, I mean, the discussion that had preceded their um, their vote um, was talking, I thought, that, like, the what they, um, or what they put as far, yeah, proposed for their amendment was specific to the going from five nitrates to 10 um, milligrams per liter, and then... I thought they said four short flats. Like I thought it was, well, I, I thought the short them. flat was very specific to them wanting to change that nitrate um, limit. So I see what you're saying. So you specifically my previous amendment uh, where I separated it as two different issues, it was all part of the same issue. That's how I understood it. Um, um, I'll follow back on yeah. that to make sure I'm right or wrong. <laughs> the, <laughs> yeah, the case from the community's website, it defines a short plat as certain minor subdivisions that may be approved by the planning officer through a no public hearing process. <coughs> so it's, well, but it's essentially, it's uh, small enough that the officer can just make the determination based on the staff without it's going to. It's a cost measure for for staff time, basically. If, a, if it's a subdivision, uh, it's going to be more complex than if it's a a single family house in an existing subdivision. Uh, and so it, it's just a way to cost out the review process. If they spot something uh, in what's a short plat review, then they're going to go into greater depth. Uh, it's just a cost measure. Well, and it's, it's what this says, the meeting's website says it has to do with the public hearing process. That's what's eliminated. And I, I think, in part, that's what. Our community, what, what I'll tell you from the Chigakiho River community, oftentimes what you have is when we have smaller developments, you know, a dad, and we've had this situation, a dad owns, you know, 20 acres and he wants to give, you know, three, uh, he wants to split it up so he can build three houses for his three kids. And we have this particular situation on the PM Gardens area. And so they don't want to go have to go through the whole, go to the public hearing, go all this kind of stuff, because we're only talking about, you know, a couple houses on 
you know, what would be a big lie, right? And so I, my understanding is they don't want to get stuck in this whole thing that, okay, we want to subdivide our, you know, and we're not doing a whole, like, recruitment subdivision. We're just doing this tiny little thing. We don't have to go through all this extra studies, all these extra requirements, because we're not really doing a whole public subdivision. So my understanding was the intent was to try to um, protect the ability of keeping the short five easy. See, and they did definitely talk about that, but that's that's not addressed by our code. I mean, that would be more yeah. their process. Um, right. Like I would so, still say we would, no matter how, whether short or long, we would still want to follow um, our particular requirements so, of the plan. Right, and I think I probably didn't articulate this well to Dean, but my, that's why I probably split out into two different things because I was trying to protect what I was understanding, but at the same time, I didn't link those two. I do, um, just for uh, Amendment 3, just like eliminating our review for the short class. Uh, worst case scenario, one came before me to take one lot, splitting it into two. Um, the one lot, they provided soils and you know, everything for that. And the other lot, we didn't look at it all because there's going to be a flat note that says that it's uh, not going to be developed, it's just going into wetlands conservation or something like that. And that's great. We won't, won't look at it. But if, if it wasn't happening that way, I would want some information because it's all class B wetlands. And um, can can they even put a septic system on there? And and uh, it is. It, and as far as that case, that's to protect the future owner that, oh man, this great lot, I get a really good deal on it. We hear that so much. There's a reason for it. And, and they can't develop. Um, that's, you know, it, and that's not good, you know. Um, so that's probably the worst case scenario for, mm -hmm. yeah, we need to look at some short plans also. Do you have planning? Yeah, I'm going to go back. I, I don't, I think I missed the mark on this one. Um, I, I'm not necessarily opposed to it, even after hearing everything I hear, but I think I, I think I might have missed a little bit of their intent. So what might end up happening is I might end up adjusting amendment to maybe not. But I'll go back and talk to Debbie about it again for the third time. <laughs> okay, so that was all the amendments we had proposed. There were um, when I had read it, you had that compared to those like district plan and you had offered um, should we choose to go that way, some wording for amendments on um, coding for the tank. Yeah. And then also the riser. And I kind of had those ready to go, and then I talked to Tank on coming out of it. So it might have made sense when we did the whole district plan, but not so much now. So, and then there's this. So, this, this actually, we got the sample yesterday? Two, two, two days ago? Yeah, so our inspector just happened to be on the job site where they're ripping up a septic tank. And the septic tank was almost 21 years old to the day. And um, this part of the tank was actually kind of like at the water line and slightly above the water line. This is the outside of the tank. It's been kind of mangled by the backhoe. This is the inside of the tank. And if you start looking at this, and I'll walk, don't, don't grab it, because we're not quite sure how well we cleaned it. Um, you put that white suit <coughs> in, it might show yeah. some of those holes. Yeah. That you can um, see this rotting from the inside out. And it's like I say, this is only 21 years old, and and so everybody in here that's got a septic tank and they're probably thinking to themselves, mm, my tank's 17 years old. I don't know what it looks like, or <laughs> and so and and this is something the industry's kind of known, and we've known that this coating method that we've been allowing forever is not adequate. So what I heard from Greer Tank, Mike Twitter, mm -hmm. said that the coating that they use. In Tar, whatever you call it now, it has a generally they use the same phrase, but he said the quality now is substantially better than it was 10 years ago. Is that me? <laughs> I, I don't know. It's uh, you'll know if you can't yeah. take a <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. That, that, that'd be one of the Ronald Reagan trust but verify type things. I don't <laughs> so, so you would support upping the like, is that the epoxy coated tank? Because that was what? a thousand bucks more for a tank. For the, for a steel tank. Yeah, yeah if, they, if, they, if they want to stick with steel tanks, and as you can see, the steel tanks, they're only 12 gauge, they're only about 
They're not even an eighth of an inch thick of steel. And, um, but they can also go to plastic tanks, HDP tanks or fiberglass tanks. And these materials don't rot, you know? Correct. Well, they, they can design them, you know, they, you're right. They're, they're more limited on the bury depth. But I think probably the big advantage to the steel tank is you, you can bury it anywhere from, you know, two feet to 10 feet deep and you don't have to do the math. Um, some of these HD plastic tanks and whatnot might be limited more like to four feet deep. Um, but a lot of, what, what we're finding is most of our tanks are, you know, the excavator is gonna, you know, put that thing as shallow as possible because digging is time and time is money. Um, so most tanks are only probably three to four feet deep, but. That was just the contents, that was not soil type damage. It was, I mean, it wasn't a city soil that ate through the tank from the outside too, but. Yeah, yeah, so I would say, you know, this is not a soils issue, and, and there are some, Content. there are some soils in Anchorage that A, a was switching to plastic pipe because they, they, they're having problems yeah. in certain parts of town, but th this is a contents issue, and it just, it really makes me wonder what, what chemically is going on inside the septic tank. We, we found with grease interceptors um, that there is this, this chemical reaction that occurs inside grease interceptors that turns them highly acidic. I mean, sulfuric acid type acidic to the point where they rock concrete. And um, obviously there's some sort of reaction going on inside septic tanks too that's making them, it might, that must be making them acidic. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, it's my understanding we're actually one of the only states in the union that allows steel septic tanks. <coughs> I, I don't have the data to back that up, but I was talking to uh, folks in the industry that don't sell steel tanks, and I'm, my company represents a company called Xerxes. We don't sell residential septic tanks, we can't compete economically with it, but what the folks at Xerxes have conveyed to me is that they're only, we're us being the only state in the union that allows steel septic and I can tell you from looking at, I've been in private practice for 27 years, and in about 15 years on these tanks, it's kind of the magic number, you can expose them to the water waterline, and, and I would guess 90% of the time, if you take a ballpoint pen and you start punching holes, even if you don't see those holes, you can just sit there with a ballpoint pen and just start punching holes through the side of them. So we, and, and there's no required separation distance from the septic tank to groundwater. The septic tank can be in groundwater. So we're running into situations where these tanks become compromised at you know, 15 years down the road, and I'm aware of some just recently at 10 years old that have, have been bad. They can leach right into the groundwater. So we go to these great lengths maybe to put in, you know, mounted systems and create separation of groundwater, and then we put steel septic tanks in the ground that are shot in 15 years leaching right into the groundwater. So I, I think we need to come up with a long-term solution some would argue, yeah, this is going to be more expensive. Yes, it will be initially, but it's not going to be more expensive in the long run. We're replacing septic tanks regularly on the hillside. Had we done this 15, 20 years ago, these folks would now be reaping the benefit of doing it right the first time. Okay. What's the cost differential between steel and fiberglass or plastic? Plastic tanks are actually real similar in price. Uh, the, the problem you run into is the limited burial depth they have on them. Um, they can only be buried uh, four feet. I think fiberglass tanks can take five feet. Now you can get custom built fiberglass tanks, but they're gonna be ghastly expensive. Um, uh, I know there's some talk about bringing concrete tanks into to Anchorage here, and also some talk about bringing high density polyethylene tanks in that will withstand a six foot barrel, which would deal with a large percentage of our situations. So to me, it seems like we ought to be looking at when there's places where we can go with plastic or HDP or uh, 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 fiberglass, uh, uh, there's, there's different types of plastic ones too, that are, uh, but there's a number of manufacturers of plastic tanks here in town. Infiltrator tanks are sold by Ferguson, tanks sold by plastic uh, tanks, uh, or we, or, or, I'm sorry, Greer, and the Lisco tanks are sold here in town. So there's a lot of alternatives for plastic tanks and, uh, um, and infiltrator tanks. Um, our biggest challenge runs is if the tanks are going to go in completely submerged in groundwater or excess burial depths. And then that's where we would then say, okay, well, maybe we have to go to concrete. Maybe a solution is on the way. I don't know. You guys may know more about that. But if we had to go to steel, then it's, okay, let's at least make it 10 gauge, which is a thicker steel. 
apply a, a, a good poly coating on it that's going to ensure that we're going to get a tank that's going to last us, you know, 30 years, 30, you know, whatever that number is. But we're not sitting here at 15 years or 10 years. I'm aware of such a two tanks here within the last uh, month that I've heard about are 10 years old that are shot, taken on water at 10 years. So I think it's a, I think it's a, a really an epidemic problem. And it seems pointless to require separation distances to groundwater and then put tanks in groundwater directly in it that are going to be leaking. We know we're going to be leaking. Same thing with holding tanks. We're putting in holding tanks in all over the hillside. And those of you who are not familiar with a holding tank, but it's basically, it's they go on sites that are unsuitable for a septic system. So basically, you dump into the holding tank, the pumper comes pumps that out every couple of weeks. Those are being installed in groundwater. And what happens is, is after a while, they start rusting and they don't have to pump their tanks as often. <laughs> because it's going out into the environment. And it kind of defeats what we're trying to do, which is protect the environment and public health, by put continually you know, putting in tanks that are, um, we know are gonna be a problem later on, so. We gotta get yeah, time at some point. Um, but this was a five years process or more, so you've had these discussions and you landed with, we're okay where we are, or is that not really comfort zone? It's interesting. It was a very long process, a five-year process, but it just kind of, just recently, after we pretty much completed the process, it, it just really hit home and came to light that how, how significant this problem was. And that's, if, if it would have hit home like a year earlier, we would have probably put this requirement in the code we delivered to you. But because it kind of came along late in the game, it came along as a recommendation for the assembly to add, add the requirement. And plus, we knew this was going to be controversial. I mean, they, they're, they're, there's one player in town who sells all the tanks, right? And we knew it was going to be kind of a controversial thing. And I guess, in a sense, we kind of punted. <laughs> Just offhand, we like to have you deal with controversy. <laughs> <laughs> but it, yeah. I would say it really was. Um, we kind of came, it came to our awareness a little late in the game and we didn't want to pull the code back to tech board. You know, they had already given it their blessing and so we were just like, we at least want to, we wanted to respond to the Hillside District Plan uh, recommendations and that they had done that recommendation and we were like, yeah, we don't, we do agree with what they're saying. And so that's just kind of how it. Um, so the wording that you had in there, you said, if you want to amend and use this wording, then that's good to create. Because I actually had amendments ready and then I thought, okay, so maybe I should bring that forward, and you'll bring that piece of that on Tuesday and be ready to talk about it. So yeah, yeah. It's like metal. But we can do thicker metal, we can do coating, and I don't know if all that Yes, they can do better coatings on the steel. It's quite a bit more expensive to do this better coating. But it'll last longer in the groundwater. Yeah. Do you want to take another look at the wording on that? And, I mean, maybe we could, yes. Thicker steel, cheaper, and that's a better way to go than the well, last longer. No, the cheaper. But is that better than a pocket coating? Oh, I, I think it's cheaper than the epoxy coating. The steel thickness? Yeah. Um, my understanding with the steel thickness, like I, I don't know how we would feel about not requiring the epoxy, but making it, them go thicker. It, it's, a, it's a coating issue. I mean, even if you made the steel thicker, it's, it lasts a little it's longer. Longer. until you address this chemical, what's going on inside the tank, it's going to. Yeah. You're probably only postponing this, you know, maybe you're postponing it, I don't know, is it two years, five years? But, mm -hmm. but you I, know, it's not going away because you made it a little thicker. I, my, my, even within this discussion, I, I'm kind of a dissenting voice on this, and I, I know that um, it works putting these epoxy coatings on. They're expensive, and the homeowners are going to see an increase in cost, and that is um, something that you know we deal with as a professional because I'm the one who has to tell the homeowner, well, okay, your tank is shot now. Instead of a $6,000 bill, it's gonna be a $8,000 bill. And they have to, you know, I'm the one who has to, to deal with it, so does Jeff. And so there's gonna be an increased cost to your constituents. And, and what's the sense? They go, okay, well, it's a 30-year tank, so I'm good with that. For 2000 bucks more, I got three times. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to move in two years, therefore, I'll put the cheapest. I mean, and, and that does damage or puts at risk the officer or puts at risk well, the neighbor. I'm going to be a little dissenting voice here, too, because here's the thing. 
we still didn't get an actual number of what the actual cost differentiation is. And I'm telling you, when my husband and I built our house, we have one of these very fancy bio cycles. So you know exactly what I'm talking about. We invested a lot of money. But when the builder comes back to us and says, you know, I need another fifteen hundred dollars, it almost made it so we couldn't build our house. We almost didn't get into the house. And so, you know, I think it's all good and fine and we can from a very a rational and reasonable perspective say, it's, yeah, it's great for the long term, but I'm in a much different financial situation now that I've been in the house 20 years than I was when I was 21 and I built the house. So now I can afford that extra $2,000 and it's an annoyance, but it's something that I look at as a good investment, but it could be a differentiating factor that people just can't get into the house because you're driving the cost of the house up because whether it's new requirements for building in the building code, now it's an septic code, and then it, you turn around and go, you know, now we have these different extra inspection fees. I mean, as we layer these fees on from a governmental perspective, we have to recognize there will be people that we push out of the, the home ownership market. And so I'm very conscientious about that. It doesn't mean that I wouldn't show Now I see this, I'm thinking, <laughs> my, I built my house in 1998, so I'm thinking, oh, I'm, and I've dealt with the septic issue before, but um, I would definitely make a different decision. And I think, hearing your, your your comments, I mean, I would choose to do something other than the steel tank, just listening to this discussion today. But I also recognize what it was like when I was 21 years old and trying to buy a house and, you know, and, and these usually paying come 14 up, bucks an hour. I mean. These usually come up <laughs> when you're selling a house, and so, the engineers are required by code to do a, a, a test for the COSA mm -hmm. and we go out there and we, we look down the tank and the levels are low even though they've been using it. That's an indication of what you've got there. And we go, yeah, you're going to have to replace your septic tank. Mm -hmm. So now they've got, you know, the real estate fees on top of that. They've got the home inspection fees. They've got the appraiser. They've got the survey. They've got our normal COSA fees. Now they've got to replace the tank. It, selling a home Unless you've got a you know hundred thousand dollars equity, you're going to lose money in selling your home. Yeah, but on the flip side of that, now I've been involved with maybe four or five of them in the last five years, where the home got sold, and within eighteen months, the people moving in it, their septic tank collapsed, and the new new people in the home had to put in a new tank. So I mean, this is not addressing it doesn't mean it doesn't cost somebody money. It's going to cost somebody money. And, and it's costing in these cases buyers because we're not required to do a physical inspection of these tanks for a home sale. We're not actually even required to measure the liquid level in the tank. It's not part of our inspection. So these things get transfer title and then like I said I had two of them within a year of the new owner moving in. They called me, I got a home in my backyard. I said well I can tell you what that is. We typically try to flag these on the on the coasts now though we'll put a note the existing septic steel septic tank is x number of years old so at least if they read it or their agent reads it or somebody they might go what does that mean how's that going to impact me so that we don't run into it at least we can point it to them when they when it collapses two years later and say well it says on your coast and they go well, i didn't even read that i had a stack of paper this tall mm -hmm. but the reality is is somebody's always going to pay for this and in, in the long run if we do it right the first time we're only putting in one septic tank we're not going to put in a new septic tank every 20 years <coughs> for the next. Okay, so I think as we'll run out of time here, but maybe revive that. I'll revive that agenda. And, and I can use the wording that was in your document here. Mm -hmm. I, think, yeah, I think we're still looking for that. Okay, we don't have a huge amount of time. But looking, the other one was a suggestion to use a 24 inch riser. We have a manhole cover in case you want to climb in. <laughs> only Steve has ever done. Kind of nine any time if you want to tour. Climb right down into it. There's a whole circuit board. So you drop in right now. Is that you, you might just see that from the board? Do you use that technology? You can get a camera down, and you can, and for example, the, the tanks are split into two compartments with an interior baffle. So you can look and sometimes see the baffles yeah. falling over, or you can see that the outlet baffles rusted, but you couldn't go along the water line because there's yeah. a scum, a thick. Mild. And this is going to happen down, down, right? And you're, yeah, you're you're still 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 right the water line. This, 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 this actually happened above the water line, at the water line, and above the water line. And probably what's going on yeah. is, it, it is the relative humidity in the tank is 100, percent and then you got the top of the tank is cold because yeah. some moisture condenses on it. So you got this acidic moisture constantly on this exposed metal surface rotting it, but. 
Every time he touches that, I want to explode for Max. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go wash up after this meeting. I'm not going to shake your hand, Rob. I, 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 I got to trust my inspector cleaned as well. <laughs> Put a camera on the you get along with your inspector. Because it's, there's no daylight on the back. It's got a black pasty bile map all grown on the inside of the tank. Whereas if you had a manhole, you could theoretically, you know, do a confined space entry, literally walk along, you know, along the inside of the tank, scrape it clean and look and look for perforations. Uh, in addition, it allows you to affect <laughs> yeah. it, it effectively allows you to clean the tank properly. Right now, all they do is they've got a four inch pipe that goes down into the tank and they stick a hose down there and wherever that thing hits, they're pumping the solids in that area, but everything else is kind of just, you know, piled around. So they can't really clean the tank. The baffles don't go all the way down to the bottom. Do they? they do. They do. The, well, the inlet and outlet baffles in the tank don't, but the interior is a, is a an entire wall. All the way in a separate column. Yeah. With a hole in the middle of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, they, you know, we've been obviously pumping septic tanks for decades, but what impact are, are we having by not properly cleaning them? I don't know, but I, I can tell you it's not possible to, to clean a tank through a four inch pipe no. properly. Are you saying that you would recommend a 24 inch man also someone would rock, climb down there every couple of years and actually scrub it's it? It's primarily for cleaning. No, you could, you could, no. It's, it's for, no, not for clubbing, but you clean it. Yeah. 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 yeah, get my dentures in right. Okay. What what I'm saying is, is from with that size opening though, you can you can look in there and move the hose around to different spots. You can take a pressure washer and shoot it around in different areas. And if you wanted to, you could partially get down in there and and, and, and clean things out if need be. But it allows you some access for maintenance, some extra access for inspection. So the pair of guys on the wall while you're drawing. Yeah. So so here's the inlet. The waste comes from the house. It goes into the tank, it hits this baffle. You got your kind of your water level through the tank is going to be at the level, and then you got another baffle coming out. So when they go to pump this compartment, they drop their four inch hose down. Or it's not a four inch hose because this is typically a four inch riser, it's about a three inch hose. They put it down this thing, and then so when they clean it, you, you get this build up of sludge on the bottom of the tank. They can really only suck up the sludge you know, within here, unless they really put some effort to shoving that hose in and bending it and, you know, versus if you had a, a, a riser right there, it would allow them to be able to much more effectively clean the tank yeah. out and see what's going on inside the tank. Could you do a six inch riser or just another pipe instead of 24? And then, um, get a, and then come straight down the middle? Yeah, I, I guess in theory you could do something like that. Are there other parts of the country that require that? Access Just 24 inches? Yes. Yeah. Manhole cover? Is that industry standard? Well, or I can tell you, our code requires a 20 inch access manhole on every septic tank in the municipal code. The problem is, is we don't require any way to access short of digging the tank up. Well, other parts of the country, they just put so a riser on there because these tanks aren't very, very deep. They don't have the insulation uh, requirements or whatnot. So those tanks might only be buried 18 inches deep and they'll have an access riser with a lid on it, you can access it. But the, our code requires an access manhole on every tank. But again, the only way to do it would be digging down to the top of the surface. Yeah. Yeah. Opening the lid yeah. up. Yeah. So it's just on the top of the tank and you bury it. Then you bury it, exactly. So they yeah. do 20 inch by default at these tank companies. And mm -hmm. if you're asking for 24, is 20 fine then? Or are you doing that? Whatever standard. Yeah, I don't know. I got, it, might, it probably would be. It's the Hillside District plan was where they came up with the 24. And I'm not really sure why they picked that number. I might be wrong on the number, but I'm pretty sure it's a 20-inch exit. You'd have to look at the code. It is a 20-inch exit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, so that, it, and, and that's just standard what our local tank builder puts on tanks. Yeah, so they'll build whatever we put in code. That's right. fact that they build mm -hmm. local. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to understand from... Um, from a, a basic everyday person perspective. So, because I don't have a traditional subject, so I can only go on what I know, which I have a, a cover in my backyard, I can open it any time, I can go down in there. Um, so other septic systems though, they don't have that, right? It's just very, you never see it really, I mean. There's two vets, four inch vets. Right, and those are those little tiny pipes that you see. But now what we're telling, saying is that 
if we were to adopt an amendment like this, every new septic system in the municipality that would come in, everybody would have some sort of hatch. And I think it's just the size one. You, you, you place it where it's going to be appropriate, not in the middle of a sidewalk going up the patio or something. Oh, no. And I know even with the vents <clears throat> that are there, I know people, you know, they, they have it, you know, you mow around it or whatever. And with a vent, you can put I just, I, I'm just whatever. wondering what the public reaction would be for everybody now that has to have, you know, a lid like I have. I mean, mine's huge. I mean, a very chunky person could get down there. It's very big. And so it's, you know, it's not necessarily pretty. It's green. So I sort of looks like my glass, so my catch grass, but. See, hmm. um, my, my putting a lid on, yeah, there's a lot of benefits to it. I mean, but there's also dangers to it. And again, there's a dissenting voice. Well, I'd be concerned because I, I, I'm afraid, you know, I don't have little kids anymore, but when they were to play out in the backyard, I was always a little concerned because there's not an actual lock on it. Exactly. Right? And so for me, it could be one of these attractive nuisances. And so I, I do see where people would be concerned because I, I was always extra cautious when the kids were little playing out back just because they could open the lid. Yeah, and, and the majority of the lids that I see, because we have them on lift stations, the majority of the lids are not secured, they're just placed on there. The screws, because Anchorage Tank has, they're a screw down as opposed to the biocycle that, the new ones, by the way, have a lock on them. Oh, they have to. I yeah. say even, even my hand even had you know, somehow but I you know we haven't seen anybody go down into I've been inside of a septic tank I've gone swimming in septic systems yeah that um, I, I, I would be concerned if every septic system had one I, I'd be concerned that that my concern is the lid's not being secured down. We have to come up with some kind of way to ensure that it locks down. The lift stations right now that I see, about half of them are not, the majority of them, maybe a little over half, aren't screwed down. And I recommend putting screws in it. Um, the other concerns that I have about putting a 24 inch riser, even though they're insulated on the outside and the lid is insulated, you do have a frost penetration and that a septic tank, as opposed to a lift station where the water is always moving in a lift station. The septic tank is a big, is an underground settling pond. It wants quiet water, quiet, take its time, let things settle out, let the biological action take, take its place. I think that you're gonna have a frost problem. I've seen a lot of sewer systems that don't have um, some kind of a frost that you, you actually freeze in the inverts. Um, I, I'm concerned you have, we'd have to come up with something to prevent frost from getting down into the septic tank. Okay, so that's another one maybe I'll bring it forward and we'll discuss it. Mm -hmm. You could make your point. I'd say out of the two, obviously the most important is the, yeah, the tank material issue, the rotting of the tanks. You can do a dozen. Yeah. <laughs> and then crush. <laughs> now, now that the door has been open, we're putting stuff on the table. <laughs> so a couple other things that I would just said, my friend. Um, is there an appeal system? Systems rejected, then what do we do? Oh, so so basically the way it would work is if uh, an engineer or uh, an expert does not agree with staff, it would get elevated to me as, as the, the manager or the supervisor or whatever. And then if they still disagreed with my position on it, they could appeal it to the tech board. And I don't think the tech board's position is binding, but um, it'd be one of the things that the department would uh, uh, pr probably honor. Is this is a code or a policy or a Current code or proposed code? Proposed code. Proposed code. I, I, I proposed code proposed code discusses yes. this a little bit, doesn't it? Yeah. The, the yeah. Right up front. The power of the tech board and whatnot. Okay, so we need to <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, right here, yeah, 1565 in addition to the powers and duties under section 44150, contested decisions made by the director may be appealed to the on-site water and wastewater technical review board. So it's this code Okay. <laughs> You're making me nervous, and he said, well, probably. Yeah. It's been a long time since <laughs> I looked at this. <laughs> it doesn't still a great deal of confidence. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. 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 Okay. 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 Yeah. Table one, I think. Uh, yeah, table one. We, we would allow for engineering judgment as long as the engineering judgment could be backed up or was, was was based on substance or data versus sometimes engineering judgment is just I'm an engineer and I say it so. But, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we don't do that. <laughs> no, no, these two don't. <laughs> so, is that, is that, is there a process in the code here that says that or you just no, I mean, if they wanted to go outside of that charter, I mean. So, th so then that would fall back to, all right, you know, staff would uh, disagree with the engineer. It would get uh, elevated to the director. Either the, the director would either agree with the engineer or staff. A and if the director agreed with staff, they could appeal it to the tech board. Okay. We've never had an issue since I've been over the on-site section get appealed to the tech board. We've always been able to work them out. Okay, and then we, we, we talked give up, give talk about the 20 or 24 inch riser. And another point was the six inch riser over the intake baffle. So instead of what you drew here, we only see, can you put it so it sees a little bit of it and then the other side you can get your hose down? Well, I think we were looking up, I think the Greer one has it over that uh, intake baffle. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. Anchorage tank, which we see more of, they're, um, it's in the center, center of the twenty. Is, yeah, is in the manhole, and that's off to the side. It doesn't go through the intake valve. So, so how do they clear clog the intake valve? There's a clean. The foundation cleanup sweeps towards the tank, and that works okay. I haven't heard any yeah. problems. Unless you have a diaper or something. Somehow they have to get it stepped all the way in there. I've had to dig some up. Teddy bears. Uh, 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 large buckets. Anything else? So we will have uh, Amy will rework Amendment 2 and 3. I'll come out with a couple that deal with the things that you recommended. She doesn't come forward with the 24 inch. I just wanted to know whose name we're going to stick on the It's already 20 by the fall. I just wanted to whose name we're going to stick on the 24 inch wall. I guess the whole committee. No, I'm not going to. No, thank you. No, thank you. Steve. You put Steve's name. <laughs> oh, I rose my hand at the wrong time. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about okay, that. Okay, you're okay. Um, thank you. Amy, you had on your amendment one, you had actually a second portion of that, paragraph B on the back side that we didn't address? Yeah, I'm going to, I was going to say, I'm going to, I was going to offer a minute one. I'm just going to pull it. Okay. That's another official use of this committee. It's dead. No, very good. No, I think, I think they made reasonable, to me, they made a reasonable uh, counter to it. We, we spent three tech review board meetings <laughs> dealing with a lot of those things. So. Yeah, I was going to say, and that's why I said it, you know, my job is to try to negotiate between the Chigak Eagle River Advisory Board and the community and what the Muni wants. And for me personally, when the Muni says, yeah, we have to your amendment, I don't always care, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> um, I care, but I'm, I, you know, I have, a, I have a duty to my constituents. And in, in Chigak Eagle River, sometimes when we say, that, you know, there's a lot of properties out there that have X, Y, Z circumstances, I think I have to try, I have to try to help address that. So. Definitely. I think at some times the problem is, is that uh, sometimes the, the people don't understand all the problems we've seen and all the reasoning of why we did that. Sure. So 
And, and that's what I said, you know, I, I understand where you're coming from with the tank, but sometimes, um, and this is why I love the planning department, and I think, um, but at the same time, we don't always agree, uh, because I'm understanding the argument, but I also understand the real world application. Like I, the example I gave of when we layer and layer and layer on fees and requirements and we drive the costs up, you can't make nearly $100 here or $1,000 there. You can't make it prohibitive. Yeah. So, but, but you also gotta keep in mind, our code is to ensure um, that health. Oh, well, absolutely. And that's not. And, no, I, no, I totally understand, you know, the arguments. And that's why I say, you know, we have to balance it. I think we've done a lot of